Hello and welcome to Fireside Chats on Numero Podcast. I'm your host, Jordan Rochester from the Global Markets Research Team. And in this episode of our Fireside Chat, I'll be talking with George Buckley, our Chief Euro and UK Economist, on his thoughts for the UK this year. I'll be asking George, where are we with COVID-19 trends? And also, what's going on with Brexit so far this year? What does that all mean for the growth and the inflation outlook? And what could be in store in the March budget coming up? And of course, the big question, will the Bank of England look to cut interest rates anytime soon? Well, first of all, before we dig into the policy debate of the UK, George, we need to address the current trends of COVID-19, the lockdowns and what's going on there. You know, we had a lockdown for a month back in November. And when we came out of that, we had the tier system and we had tiers one to tiers three. Then we had tier four. We had the news of the UK's more transmissible variant. And that led to another lockdown, which the December lockdown, late December. And that's where we are now. We're working from home still. And in a few months time, you know, a few weeks, it'll be not too long before you and I will be saying it's been a year since we've last sat in the office next to each other. Are we seeing signs, George, of this current lockdown working? Are cases, hospitalizations, and hopefully fatalities slowing down anytime soon? Well, I, thanks, Jordan. I, I don't think the government really had much choice other than to uh, go down the route of a full lockdown just because of where the case numbers were going uh, over the Christmas period, before the Christmas period and, and in the start of January. And of course, we peaked at exceptionally high numbers. Now, the good news is that case numbers are coming down from those very high levels. Uh, as a proportion of the population. We've seen that happen in a number of countries, the UK, the US, for example. There are other countries in Europe where the opposite's happening, and Spain has yet to see its peak in case numbers, which are sort of heading in the same direction as, of, of what the UK numbers were uh, previously. Now, when you look at deaths, they look like they're plateauing again, um, like they did at the, in the sort of spring, summertime last year. Um, but again, at exceptionally high levels, uh, relative to spring last year, and also importantly, relative to what's been going on in other countries. The UK seems to be leading the league table, if there is one, of uh, fatalities, which is, is not a good place to be. Uh, we've just passed the grim milestone of 100,000 people who've died of uh, with COVID. Um, that was marked this week. We've seen hospital admissions, they've been trending down as well, which is encouraging. Uh, but again, they got to levels which were higher than last spring. Um, the number of patients in hospitals look to be peaking. Those in uh, ventilator beds, they're still rising, unfortunately, but the good thing is that they're rising at a slower pace. So I think what to take from all of these numbers is that we got to very high levels on all of them. We have, we're looking like we're either peaking or past the peak, in, certainly in terms of cases. So the news is encouraging, but there's a long way to go. For markets, we had to adopt a completely new framework of, of trading intraday vol trading the headlines. We went from a world where we still are in a world where government spending, uh, monetary policy, central bankers and politicians uh, comments move markets. But the other side of that is following all of these charts. So you've talked about how cases, hospitalizations are slowing down. There's also the other chart, which is a relatively new chart, um, which is the the vaccines chart. You know, It's been a bit of a weird week in terms of there's lots of bad news, good news, and there's also been some fake news when it comes to the vaccines. So the bad news that we've seen this week is that supply expectations look to have taken another hit in Europe. It's been a pretty slow start to the rollout in the first place. The good news, though, is that the real world vaccine rollout in Israel, which is uh, currently um, doing the most as a proportion of its population, um, looks to have provided some good results for Pfizer's vaccine so far with the, with the empirical data. The efficacy is quite high. Um, and the sort of fake news that we've witnessed is uh, this recent German article in the press mixing up the statistics of AstraZeneca's trial data and reporting that it was only 88%, sorry, 8% effective um, for sort of uh, the elderly uh, part of that, that, that trial. Look, it was a number that was discovered to be confused. So there was actually just 8% of people in that trial within that age group. And I don't want to get down into the specifics of that, George. It just sums up how markets are having to react to these sorts of stories now when it comes to vaccines. So where are we for the UK, George? Seems pretty good so far. 
But what are the targets that we should have in mind and what could be the disappointments and also what could be the good news in the pipeline? Sure. Well, so far, I mean, it has been relatively good news. We've seen uh, around about 11, 12 percent of people uh, having been vaccinated or at least 11 percent of the population having received doses so far. Now, that's not far off twice the proportion that the US has done, for example. Uh, it's a lot higher than the two to three percentage uh, point rates that major European countries have done. So we're reasonably ahead of most countries. Of course, we're not quite the same as, as Israel and there's a number of um, um, Middle Eastern countries who've done quite well with their vaccination programme so far. But when you compare them to countries in, in the UK's peer group, I think we're, we're doing pretty well. Now, the government's target is that they intended to um, deliver 15 million first doses um, I think by the middle of February, uh, to the most vulnerable categories of people. So we're about halfway there. We've delivered seven and a half million doses so far. Um, so I'm, I'm reasonably encouraged. I think that the concern is that you, you need more than just uh, these four categories of most vulnerable to be immunised against the virus before you can be confident that lifting restrictions will not lead to another bout among people who are of younger ages. The good news is, of course, is that those people of younger ages are having far less significant symptoms than people of the vulnerable and older age categories. So that gives me some hope and confidence that at some point over the coming months, we will start to see vaccinations be successful, people being immunised either via vaccination or by having by the virtue of having had the virus in the first place. And therefore, we see some remission in the virus, both naturally and because of vaccinations, which will lead to an opening up of the economy and a resurgence in demand. Yeah, we've had some charts in the background whilst you were talking there, George. We've, we've had some charts on numeraconnects.com. There's a video if you're listening to this on the podcast store. And on in those charts, we had the declining cases, we had the declining hospitalizations. The one that we just had on the screen there is the vaccine chart, which you described. And just looking at that chart, it looks like the UK is really doing well compared to peers. Um, the US as well, uh, like you described. The European story, George, is is one of disappointment for how slow it's been. But it's only just, if you compare the gradient, it's only just where the US was just a few weeks ago. So hopefully there is some light at the end of the tunnel. Let's move on from vaccines to the other part of the the, the equation, which is lockdowns we also have to keep an eye on lockdowns so we've got what's going on with cases vaccines and lockdowns what can we reasonably say about the timeline of the uk's lockdowns george are you and i for example are we going to be able to go to the pub together next month um is it going to be longer than that and what about when we actually sit next to each other again in the office when what, what sort of timeline would you expect well as you said jordan we haven't been in the office together for quite some time now since the end of march last year it seems like a lifetime ago um, and i can tell you there's nothing i'd like more than to sit down in a pub not wearing a mask and having a pint with you uh, i'm not sure that's going to happen for a while because a bit like the vaccines the governments are prioritizing or will prioritize the reopening of the economy depending upon what's the most important and urgent things that need they need to get back up and running again so you would hope to think that things like Childcare and schooling would be the first things to uh, to reopen, um, then non-essential shops. And I suspect that hospitality, such as cafes, restaurants, bars, are going to be fairly low down the food chain in terms of how long it takes to get them reopened. It's not going to be as soon as things like um, essential travel and, and, um, and uh, things like uh, schools. Um, now, um, a few things to look at when it comes to uh, reopening. Uh, a very, very useful chart that Oxford University provide is a stringency index, which we uh, can look at. That shows how stringent some of the government's restrictions have been. We compare, compare that across time. We compare it across countries. Now, the idea that this is going to give you a perfect relationship with GDP, telling you how output changes relative to lockdowns, it's just not going to. But it is helpful, of course, in, in framing our forecasts for economic growth, because it's telling us how much the government is restricting what we're doing and therefore uh, restricting it. But one big difference, of course, is that for any given lockdown now, it's not going to have the same impact on GDP as it might have done in the past. People are changing their business models. Well, let's move away from COVID-19. There's the other uh, big issue for the UK, the issue for the past four years to five years, it's Brexit. Uh, 
Um, we haven't moved on from Brexit. We're now living in Brexit. So have we actually seen any signs of the significant disruption at the borders like we expected to see with an FTA? Um, I've already had a few colleagues have to move country, for example. Uh, when it comes to ordering up things online, I've noticed it's taking a, a few weeks longer than I expected for some things to arrive. Does this disruption, George, for trade and commerce, has it started to show up in any high frequency numbers you're tracking? Uh, certainly it has, yeah. And and I, I mean, I'm getting the impression that that rather than the sort of wide scale disruption of, you know, 20, 30 mile tailbacks at the ports of lorries and things like this. I think the problem has to some extent, and I say some extent, been a little bit more isolated than these general uh, problems that that had been expected prior to, to the event, prior to the start of this year. So we've seen, for example, fishing has suffered from export delays because of uh, the need for customs declarations. Uh, there's been some in room for interpretation of these things and not all uh, freight has been going through with the right customs declarations. We've got paperwork requirements having been impacted um, on trade between the UK mainland and Northern Ireland. Uh, we've seen, for example, at the start of January, pictures of Northern Ireland uh, grocery shelves empty. Um, some European companies have either suspended exports to the UK or they have stopped them permanently. Um, there seems to be a story every day about some high profile company having done that. Um, we've seen shipping uh, fall relative to the normal uh, amounts of shipping passing through the UK for a January. We've seen air freight and air passengers, of course, much more uh, decline. So there have been a lot of things clearly which have been impacted, not just by Brexit, but also by COVID. Sometimes it's a bit difficult to separate these two things out. Um, but not least, I, so some of the stories that we've been hearing are certainly indicative of there being some challenges at the ports, but I don't think it's as widespread as some people had feared. Well, are there any other dates to bear in mind this year when it comes to UK politics, George? I'm thinking elections or Brexit review dates. What sort of things are there in the pipeline? Well, in terms of Brexit, of course, there is the ongoing uh, talks between the UK and, and Europe in terms of the uh, financial sector, uh, which uh, it, the, the two parties are hoping to at least come to some conclusion by the end of uh, this first quarter. It may slip from that. Uh, we've also got the March budget, of course, at the, at the very start of March on the 3rd, uh, which will be a lot of interest in what Mr Sunak has to say uh, and do. Um, and uh, other things of interest. We have local elections in May, which is going to be a good barometer of how the government has been dealing with COVID. Um, I think probably one of the most important events of the year might be on the same date, the uh, 6th of May Scottish parliamentary elections. Now, um, COVID might yet delay that, we don't know. Uh, but a big win for the SNP could mean a renewed mandate for an independence referendum following the 55-45% result that we saw uh, after 2014. Now, what the SNP would argue, of course, is that we have had a change in circumstance. We have left the European Union. So this is an important uh, reason to have another referendum because the Scots were very much in favour of staying in the EU. Uh, how, whether this is um, whether we do get a referendum, I think it's going to be quite challenging in a world of COVID and it might not happen for some time, but certainly it's on the risk factors when it comes to politics over the coming year. Absolutely. I think that's a, a podcast for another time um, when we get closer to that event. Let's move to the growth, the inflation, the fiscal and the monetary policy views from you. So let's always start with growth. Let's look at the impact COVID-19 and Brexit has had on the economy. The UK was one of the biggest underperformers last year, uh, George. Um, I did an Asia podcast last week and we were discussing which economies in the Asia, re Asia region were going to be on track this year to recover to back to where they were before COVID. So the 2019 GDP level, and there was only a few of them, but there was a few countries that did stand out that would get back to where they were pre-COVID. Can we say the same about the UK, given how much it's fallen? Or do you expect to see permanent scarring and 2019 GDP levels are quite distant away? <laughs> 
Yeah, and I think your question is very pertinent, Jordan, because you do ask about growth and GDP levels, and I think that's really important. It, it's almost, the, 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 it tends to be the case that for any country, the, the bigger you fall, the bigger bounce you'll eventually see when it comes to growth rates. So I've been trying to focus on levels of output. I think that's a lot more interesting a question is where we get to and whether we recover uh, quickly or whether it takes some time. Now, you're absolutely right. The UK has performed worse than most other European countries, along with Spain as well. Now, some of that could be because the UK has a very large service sector. Um, now, part of that, obviously, manufacturing has been a lot more insulated. Construction has been more insulated from the downturn because you've got no choice. If you have to go to work, you know, you can't you can't construct a building or manufacture something from your office or your kitchen. Whereas you can do the job that we're doing. I mean, we're both doing it from our homes at the moment, uh, this podcast. So because you've got a larger service sector, yes, for sure, finance and, and, and sectors like this are actually potentially better insulated, but certainly parts of the service sector, have, have seen, hospitality in particular, have seen very sharp declines. So that could be part of the reason. Another part of the reason, and I think this is really interesting, is that it's the way that some parts of particularly public services are measured is very different in the UK than it is elsewhere. For example, if you look at education, uh, the way it's measured in the UK is we try and work out how many, how much schooling is being delivered, the volume of schooling. Now, obviously, that's fallen. Whereas in some European countries, the way it is measured is by looking to start with at the wages that are paid to teachers. Now, if teachers are still employed, it's not you're not going to see a very large fall in wages. And indeed, you haven't in the UK. Teachers have still been employed, but the amount of teaching that's been delivered has fallen. And that's why in some of these sectors, you are seeing a measurement problem or a measurement issue. Perhaps the UK is doing it better than elsewhere by measuring volumes, but certainly it's had an impact. Now, in terms of where we're going to end up, we think that recoveries, um, not just in the UK, but but certainly across Europe are going to look like a what I've described as a misshapen W. So you have a very sharp fall after the first lockdown back in March, April. You get a recovery as we saw some sort of remission in the virus over the summer. It went back down again, of course, as we had the, uh, the, the new wave of the virus over the autumn winter time. And the recovery, I don't think is going to be a nice sharp V-shaped looking recovery. I think it's going to take a long time before we get back to levels of output which are similar to what they were in 2019 before the virus struck. And um, the, uh, the, there's a, if you look at the numbers of where consensus forecasts are for GDP in 2022 relative to 2019, the UK is one of the worst performers. People didn't, or economists and analysts do not expect us to get back to levels of GDP um, which are normal again, if you want to call 2019 normal, for quite some time. And 2022, we're still 2% below where we were pre-virus. So I think we're in it for the long haul. There have been helpful uh, shifts in productivity, of course, potentially, but I think it's going to be a very long time before we start to see output recover to uh, what we saw pre, uh, pre, uh, pre-virus. So hopefully the risks are skewed towards positive news um given we're in lockdown we need to see some optimism to get us through this but what if we're what if i'm wrong there so what if we see lockdowns continue what if the uk goes for a covid elimination strategy with the vaccine rollout but also having a longer lockdown so we're seeing reports and headlines that boris johnson's perhaps lifting lockdown to some extent mid-february march april easter and so forth what if they don't do that what if we it leads to um let's say a lockdown until june the end of june it's an extreme scenario but what in that's in that case george what would that mean for your forecast well i think this has certainly happened and we were discussing this before the podcast is that you know at the start of the year when we were told that schools were closing we were told that they were going to be closed till at least the half term in the middle of middle to end of february and now we're thinking, well, it might be even longer than that. It could be the actual whole term, which is out and possibly even encroaching into the summer term. And I think that you know you have seen this, that you don't get told when a lockdown is going to end and that's going to be it. I mean, that certainly was the case back in uh, back in um, November, December time, early December uh, we had the lockdown lifted. We were told it was going to be lifted at the start of the lockdown at that point. 
But as it happens, that wasn't sufficient and we had to go into a renewed lockdown. So I think these things do happen and they do get prolonged. And it's very difficult to be sure that you know what path the virus is going to take sufficiently uh, that you can be sure of when these lockdowns will end. That said, if you look at, for example, all of the indicators of lockdowns, for example, look at mobility, that has a reasonably good relationship between monthly GDP in the UK. And so we can have a good stab at what we think will happen uh, when these lockdowns are uh, implemented. Final point on this is that and as I mentioned this before, when you have a lockdown, it might not have the same impact on GDP as the original lockdown because people are changing their behaviour, companies are changing their business models, and they are adapting much better than they did in the first lockdown so that they continue with their life, with their business, and economic output can continue as close as it can possibly to normal, uh, meaning a smaller impact on GDP. There's the other side of the coin, which is when we do reopen, hopefully consumers have built up some excess saving from working from home, not socialising, not going on holiday. When we do reopen, George, do you expect some sort of um, you know, economic boom in, in one case with all those excess savings perhaps being used up? Yeah, a couple of positives and a couple of negatives here. The positives are that, yes, people could well spend the excess savings that they've built up. The saving ratios have increased across across the world, actually, because of this. People have retained their jobs because of furlough schemes. They've seen their incomes, in, in certainly for some people at least, their incomes have been retained, yet they've not been able to spend money. So the natural consequence is savings going up. Now, that could be spent. It could be used as deposits for houses. And we've probably seen some of that as well, uh, because the housing market is doing very well in the UK. Um, the negatives, though, are, number one, if, if you didn't have a holiday last year you or for the last two years you might not then decide to go on two immediately so once you've missed the boat with the uh, spending on a service you don't necessarily go and catch two of them if that makes sense um, and the other point is that the cohorts of people who are doing the saving are people who tend to be a little bit richer the poorer some poor people who've lost their jobs because they've been in hospitality or they've had their incomes cut because they've been in these sort of uh, businesses have seen their savings fall and higher um, higher income cohorts of people tend to have lower marginal propensities to consume. So they are just at the margin, perhaps some of the, uh, the, the negative parts to the news that the savings ratio has gone up and we could be seeing a lot more spending. I want to move on to inflation now. I think that's going to be the big question this year. How quickly does it rise and do, do policymakers react to it? So 2020, we had a decade-long recovery slammed into reverse. Inflation, inflation fell as a result. Energy prices really collapsed. We had negative oil prices uh, for a very brief period. So it's really, really easy for inflation this year to show signs of a pickup. It's what we call the base effects. So this year, it's not as bad as last year, um, or at least stabilized its prices. Um, and so what is the view on UK inflation, George? Is it like the US view where inflation's going to uh, briefly spike above 3%? Or is it like the euro area where it fails to rise above 2%? Um, where is the UK in this uh, sort of spectrum? Well, I suspect we're somewhere in between. If you look at the Bank of England's forecast, which of course are going to get adjusted over the course of the next week with the February Monetary Policy Committee meeting, um, the last set of forecasts that the bank published in November showed inflation broadly at, or maybe even slightly above 2%, in the one, two, and three year ahead forecast horizons. Now, that's a long way from being 3%. After all, don't forget the, the Federal Reserve now has an average inflation target. It is be encouraged to run inflation above the target to uh, offset some of the previous uh, periods of below target inflation. But in the UK, we have a 2% on the nose inflation target, and uh, that's pretty much where the Bank of England thinks it will be. And as you rightly say, we are going to be looking at sizable increases in inflation this year because of a number of factors, uh, one being changes in VAT, one being uh, the uh, recovery in energy prices. And as you say, you don't even need to see a rise in energy prices. The, the base effects will be fairly sizable, even if energy prices had remained constant, but they didn't. Energy prices have rebounded. So we will start to see some impact of those on inflation. And I think what's more interesting is the longer, the medium and longer term 
uh, impact on inflation from huge increases in money supply, which have been generated by quantitative easing, uh, the rise in asset prices that we've seen more generally, particularly housing markets. And what that means together with fiscal easing, how all that policy loosening, what does it do when we uh, when we look towards the medium term? Does it have an inflationary impact or is, is the the fact that we are still seeing weak demand and output is still very soft, is, is that going to have a disinflationary impact? And the, the, the final point I want to mention on this in terms of the long, the long term is when economists, or the medium term should I say, when economists are looking at um, the, uh, the, the inflation, we tend to use a sort of New Keynesian Phillips curve style approach. In other words, we look at demand relative to supply and say, where are the two? What's the balance between those two? Is it going to add to inflation or is it going to subtract from inflation? Now, if you think about demand and supply, they're unobserved. We only actually observe what happened. We don't observe, we, we observe the reduced form. We don't observe both sides of this equation, if you will. So we're trying to guess what demand is and supply is, two very big numbers, which you actually don't know what they are. Very, very difficult, therefore, to judge what the output gap is. And it just goes to your previous point before. Are we going to see some sizable hit to uh, the supply capacity and potential of the UK economy? Or is that going to spring back very quickly? Because they have very different implications for inflation. What about there's the consumer price inflation, George, but there's also asset price inflation. You've mentioned the housing market. Well, if I look at the data in the UK for housing transactions, house prices, it's been a bit. On, it's been a bit of, uh, of a storm, really, hasn't it? That we've seen uh, record highs in UK house prices. Should we expect this to change this year? Is the, is the narrative going to change when the stamp duty uh, holiday comes to an end in this upcoming budget, or do you expect that stamp duty to uh, that cut we've had to be extended? Well, I think the housing market is going to slow in twenty twenty one, but I don't think it's going to slow as quickly as some people think. Now, let me just explain that. The the negatives for 2021 is that the labour market, we're probably going to see unemployment increase. We've seen wages fall and be hit, oops, be hit by the, uh, the fact that people are being furloughed. Interest rates, if you look at where they've gone, mortgage rates, they've gone up over the past year. And as you say, the tax uh, benefit of lower stamp duty is going to come to an end in March. That said, what will ameliorate any impact, any negative impact on the housing market will be the fact that people have all these savings, like you mentioned, Jordan, like the Chancellor could extend the stamp duty uh, cut. He could change the entire system of stamp duty if he wanted to. Affordability doesn't look that bad when you look at repayment to income ratios in the housing market. There has been a huge demand for space. People want their own space because of the pandemic. Um, so commercial real estate's loss has been residential's gain. And finally, again, as you mentioned, quantitative easing is the is the policy that floats all boats. Asset prices more generally, not just housing, but more generally have been benefiting from this. We've got a few minutes left of the podcast, George, and we have to cover the two policy levers. There's the fiscal lever and then there's a the monetary policy lever. We've kind of hinted at the budget, but let's talk about the UK's um, fiscal stance overall. Let's get a stock take on how much the UK has spent. So before we ask what will come next, let's see what's been done. How much has the UK government spent on this COVID-19 pandemic to date and how does that compare to international peers? Well, the deficit, which is a combination of a couple of things, it will tell you how much the government has spent directly on the pandemic, but also it will tell you how much the automatic fiscal stabilisers will cost. And the expectations there are that for this fiscal year, 2020-21, the deficit is going to be somewhere in the region of around about 20% of GDP. Now, next year, 2021-22, uh, it's expected to fall, but still, it the OBR, the Office of Budget Responsibility, thinks it could be around about the 7.5% mark, which relative to past history is exceptionally high. And I think, if anything, the risks might be to the upside, given uh, what we've seen uh, over the first quarter of what we are seeing in the first quarter of this year. So high levels. The IMF also has published charts looking at what each country has done on a discretionary basis. And the UK, relative to its peers, is sort of towards the top of that table. Uh, so Germany, US, UK have all done quite a lot of fiscal easing from a discretionary standpoint. When well, you mentioned discretionary, there's the other side, which is non-discretionary, the automatic stabilizers, which is furlough scheme, for example. So we've, we've got to ask what's next. Um, 
Will the UK go the way of the US? Last week, we heard Janet Yellen, the incoming Treasury Secretary, she said the plan is to go big. Uh, that's, that was her statement um, the other week about when it comes to spending uh, going forward. But with the UK, the narrative in the papers as to uh, the view from the Treasury seems a little bit like 2010 again about tightening the purse strings and making sure it's affordable for the government to be borrowing like this. Do you expect to see a tightening of the purse strings, George, this year? I think this year is too early. Um, but that said, even if you look back in the uh, budget or the, the uh, autumn statement from last year, uh, the government and Treasury did tighten some parts of the, uh, the, the fiscal purse strings, but not very much. Certainly not very much when you compare what they did back in 2010 in the, uh, over the summer and also the autumn of 2010. They tightened a heck of a lot more than what we've seen so far. I don't think it's the right time to do it. When they do it, I think it'll have to be a combination of a number of things. Um, things like, for example, austerity. Just by doing nothing, by the way, will also tighten the purse strings because things like the furlough scheme will end naturally. And therefore, they don't need to do a huge amount for, for the deficit to come back down. What they will need to do is think very carefully about whether they want to reduce debt to GDP ratios or whether they are happy with debt to GDP standing at these levels. And to that end, it really is a an absolute versus relative issue. Are you relatively okay with the fact that your deficit is high now because everywhere else is? Or are you worried about the fact that in absolute terms it's so big that it wouldn't take much of an increase in interest rates to have quite a sizable effect on your ability to service it? Well, when you mention austerity, there's two, there's two forms. One is um, cutting spending, which uh, was we saw in 2010. The other one is just raising taxes, so keeping spending at relatively similar levels to pre-COVID. Um, but raising the taxes to pay for what's just being borrowed for this pandemic. If we see taxes go up, George, which ones would you expect are most likely to be uh, to be raised to deal with this? Um, well, I think they've got to be very careful here. Um, I mean, corporation tax is the obvious one because it applies to profits made. And if companies are starting to make profits again, then it doesn't seem unreasonable that they should be uh, taxed on those profits. That said, those profits also might be going back into plugging uh, very big holes in the past, but that should be taken into account in, in, in the way the tax system works anyway. So I think corporation tax would be the most obvious, but I think it needs to be a combination of spending and uh, taxes. On the spending side, that said, the government is very keen to go down this levelling up approach whereby they try to support by investment uh, parts of the economy which have not had that support over recent years. And in that sense, I think spending might be a little bit more insulated. There's the other side, which is we've seen some headlines about how in the budget we might learn about what benefits there are at Brexit at this stage. When it comes to deregulations, do you expect anything like that in terms of reform um, that we could see this year? Well, I think they need to be a bit careful at the moment, uh, only because at the moment the uh, European Union is deciding uh, what uh, it should do in terms of the financial sector and w w what sort of uh, freedoms it will grant the financial sector to, to operate in Europe. And part of that decision is going to depend upon how willing the UK is to go down the deregulation route. If we go down the deregulation route, the EU may be a little bit less inclined to grant the sort of, uh, the, the sort of freedoms that we would like to have uh, to operate in Europe, and therefore they've got to be a bit careful. Okay, that's the fiscal side done. The last but not least, we've got monetary policy. We've got the old lady of Threadneedle Street, which is the Bank of England. We've actually got a Bank of England meeting coming up soon. We've had lots of chatter from the Bank of England members themselves on the MPC and a review right now into whether to explore negative interest rates in the UK. Gun to your head, George, is the next move from the Bank of England a rate cut or a rate hike? Well, I'll answer that by saying I don't think they're going to cut rates. Um, so it might be a long, long time before they raise rates, but I don't think that a rate cut will be forthcoming in the near term. Now, again, this is going to depend upon the outlook for the economy, how the virus progresses. And I do think that the bank will be very keen to make sure that rate cuts below zero are in the toolkit. And to that end, I would not be surprised if the February Monetary Policy Committee meeting announces that very fact, that they can use them if they want. And you might even see somebody voting 
for negative rates on the committee as soon as the February meeting. After all, economic output is likely to be significantly hit because of COVID uh, in the first quarter. So um, I'm I think it's going to be in part of the toolkit. I don't think it'll be used, but lots of risks, uh, certainly to the, uh, to the downside to interest rates. Especially if we have a few members voting for a rate cut, that'll keep the idea alive for the next few months. The other side is QE, um, the Bank of England's quantitative easing programme. It slowed down last year. We had, we, uh, we've seen a, a slowdown overall from where it got to at the peak of the crisis. And the charts I look at, the Bank of England's purchases are kind of in between the, the, the size in GDP terms of the US and the Euro area again, um, the UK was at one stage buying a lot of the net issuance. The Bank of England was buying a lot of the net issuance from the U- UK Treasury. Is that the same or are we seeing net issuance after QE purchases start to perk up in the UK, George? So the, the way it's worked has been that at this very start of the pandemic, the Bank of England started buying at a weekly pace of around about 13.5 billion uh, per week. They're now doing four and a half billion per week with, and there was an interim number of about seven billion um, just before the uh, before the uh, summer. So they have come down quite a lot, uh, but equally they are still buying at a reasonably swift pace, four and a half billion. Uh, they are intent on that four and a half billion being reduced further. So you wouldn't be able to continue at four and a half billion per week for every single week of 2021. Um, and keep it to 150 billion envelope in total. So they will have to, if they want to keep stick to that 150 billion, they will have to reduce the amount they're purchasing again. But that would be consistent with the economy recovering. And of course, there's no need to actually increase the uh, the rate of QE at the moment, simply because the, the markets are, are, are relatively uh, have, have dealt with this relatively well. We haven't seen any um, big increases in in gilt yields, for example. So I, I I don't think that the bank really needs to go down the route of increasing the weekly rate. And if anything, I think it will be reduced further, maybe towards the middle of the year. I mean, personally, it just seems odd that central banks are so hawkish. I mean, I, they don't, I mean, they're not that hawkish, I guess, but. The fact the conversation is talking about removing the, the support that we saw last year at this stage, whilst we are in lockdown still, um, shows you just how confident folks are with the recovery. So let's hope let's hope there is the strong recovery that everyone's hoping for this year. But there is the risk that you know, it, liquidity will need to be kept here longer than sort of the conversations people are having. There's one last question on the Bank of England, which is a bit more medium term. Um, which is, would they be inclined to change their strategy down the line? By that, I mean take some sort of uh, 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 take some sort of inspiration from the Fed, who's adopted average inflation targeting. I remember the previous Governor Carney had his famous Lambda speech, where by proxy the Bank of England was tracking the output gap in their deliberations as well. But that was never really formalised. Could this pandemic lead to any changes in the Bank of England's approach, or perhaps you know their change of tools as well? Uh, I think the bank is always on the lookout for how to change its toolkit, but I think it would be wrong personally for, for them to go down the route of average inflation targeting. Um, I think average they've taken a long time to get to this point whereby people understand that there is a 2% inflation target in the UK. Once you go down the route of average inflation targeting, you're no longer effectively targeting 2% in any one year. There is a huge debate about how long you should look backwards to say we need to adjust for the misses that we've had in the past in the future and how long do you try and adjust them for into the future and you won't have an inflation target of two percent effectively i mean you will over the long term but not in the short term and i think that really does risk undermining the inflation target so i doubt we will get a change in the two percent on the nose at all times inflation target but i do think that the bank will always be on the lookout for how to change its um, its toolkit, which of course we hopefully will hear about uh, in terms of negative interest rates next week. And that 2% inflation target, it's been there since 1997. Um, so it's, it's had a good run. Um, so let's see, George. And with that, it's a wrap. And thank you for joining the podcast. Thanks, Jordan. So those are the views from us. Those are the trades from us. And that's the fireside with George Buckley. Thank you for listening into the podcast. If you enjoyed listening to the show or want to hear more from Nomura's economists, researchers, and investors, please like and subscribe to Nomura's podcast on Apple, Spotify, and SoundCloud, or wherever you do get your fill of podcasts. If you're feeling generous, please do leave a review on your podcast store of choice, preferably a nice one.
And please do log on to NomuraConnects.com to keep up to date and keep on listening. Thanks, goodbye for now, and stay safe.